Okay, um, I'm now going to lecture on chapter 8. So if you turn to page 131, you have the, the uh, lecture notes on that chapter. Um, this lecture begins with a review of something I covered way back during week 1, which is the, the basic problem of statistics. So the basic problem of statistics is that there's some universe or population that we want to study. So if we want to study, um, you know, uh, adult males living in the United States, that might be our population. Or, what, what, you know, this usually corresponds to a target segment definition. Um, and there's something we'd like to know about that population, which we call the parameter. So the parameter is a numerical fact about the population. We might want to know purchase intent for some new product idea that we have. So the mean purchase intent would be the parameter. Now there's no way that we can go off and measure everybody in the population to you know, do a census and know the, the parameter uh, with certainty. So instead what we usually end up doing is drawing a sample. And from that sample we compute a statistic. So if we interviewed 400 people about this product and asked them about their purchase intent and computed the average of those 400 people, the average of the sample is an example of a statistic. And that statistic estimates the parameter. So that's a review of you know, chapter 2 or so whenever we talked about that. Now for um, the only new piece on this slide. How do we draw that sample? Well, there's two different approaches. One's called simple random sampling. The other one is simple random sampling with replacement. Now, simple random sampling is just what you usually think of uh, when you think of random sampling. So with simple random sampling, picture having a list of everybody uh, in the population. That's called a sampling frame. And suppose that we could write everyone's name on a little ticket and put each ticket in a hat and mix up that hat and start drawing out names. So if I keep drawing those names, if I wanted a sample of 400, I'd pull out 400 tickets and I'm done. That's a simple random sample. Simple random sampling with replacement is a little bit different. Simple random sampling with replacement works as follows. I still have those tickets. They're still in the hat. The hat's very well mixed. I draw out a ticket and I call up that person, execute my survey. Then I put the ticket back in the hat. I stir up the hat, shake it a few times, and then I draw out another ticket. So I've replaced the ticket and there's some probability, uh, usually quite small probability, that um, I, I would draw the same name twice. All right, um, that's simple random sampling with replacement. So I, I draw a name, I draw a ticket, I put it back in the hat, I do that 400 times. Now, um, why the difference? Well, all statistical software packages, uh, including Excel and SPSS, assume the bottom one, simple random sampling with replacement. The formulas going forward in Siegel are going to assume the, the bottom one. The reason for this is that it's a lot easier to deal with. Uh, the formulas are a lot easier. You have independence across the draws, whereas in simple random sampling, there's a certain dependence. The probability of getting a, uh, a, a number changes when, when there are fewer tickets in the hat. Now, the good news is that um, when, when your populations are large and your sample sizes are fairly small, um, there's very little difference between these, and you don't have to do anything about it. In situations where the population is not so large, and you're drawing a large fraction from that population, there are some correction formulas that you, you can use. Um, let's not get into those. Um, I, I, I don't think they're especially important, so we're going to skip over the uh, correction formulas. Now, Chapter 8 talks about sampling distributions. Sampling distributions are one of the most uh, subtle ideas in this whole course. And so it's um, because it's so subtle, I think that the best way to, to get our arms around it is to consider a, a tiny example. I mean, the only way we can get our arms around this is through a, a, a tiny example. So this slide is probably the most important slide in the whole course packet. If you get this slide, um, statistics will, will make sense at a deeper level to you. And if you don't get this slide, then um, you should watch this video again. 
So let's uh, let's say that we have a population with only three sampling units in it. And let's say that I've done a little census, and here are the measures uh, on those three people. So the numbers are 0, 2, and 4. This could be something like, how many dogs do you have? So one person has 0 dogs, the next has 2 dogs, the next has 4 dogs. So that is, um, that is our entire population. We could go off and find the parameters. So, for example, the mean parameter would be just the sum of these three numbers divided by 3. So the mean number of dogs in this population is 2. We could also find the variance. So here is the population variance, which is another parameter. Go use the formula from chapter 5, and you find that the variance is 8 thirds. Okay, so we know the answer because we have a census. Now let's consider drawing a sample. And we, you know, for one reason or another, we don't have money to call up all three people. We only have money to uh, do a sample of two. What could happen? Well, whereas these parameters that we just found are fixed constants, if we repeat the census, these numbers are not going to change. Okay? S the, uh, the, the values that we get from a sample will change depending on the sample. So let's think about every possible thing that could happen. And I've enumerated all those possible samples. So one thing that could happen is I draw Mr. Zero. Uh, I call him up, I say, how many dogs do you have? He says zero. Put the name back in the hat, uh, shake it up again, draw a ticket out again, and I get, lo and behold, Mr. Zero again. Call him up, how many dogs do you have? Zero. Okay, so one possible sample is that I get two zeros. In that case, the statistic x bar will also take the value 0. Another thing that could happen is that I call up Mr. 0, and then I call up Mr. 2. In that case, the sample mean would be 0 plus 2 divided by 2 is 1. So I hope you can see how uh, there's a relationship between the sample and this x bar. All right, so if we get 0 and 4, the sample mean is 2. All right. Now the point with this is that the statistic x bar depends on the particular sample that we draw. If we draw a different sample, we'll get a different value of x bar. Now we can think about the distribution of these x bars since it's a random quantity. Mu and sigma don't have distributions because they're fixed parameters. Uh, x bar does since it varies. It depends on this random thing, which is uh, which two people I happen to call, which two people came into the sample. So we can make a distribution. Notice that there is one way of getting a zero. So one chance in nine of getting a zero. There's two ways of getting a one. So the chance of us getting an x bar of one is two ninths. There's three ways of getting a two. So that's um, three ninths or one third, and so forth. So Across these nine samples, there are five possible x-bar values, and here are the um, corresponding probabilities. This is called a sampling distribution. So a sampling distribution refers to what could happen to the statistic across the possible samples that you're drawing. Now, we can graph this sampling distribution. Off to the right is the probability histogram. And you'll see that uh, there's, um, you know, the, the modal value is 2, and it kind of falls off symmetrically on both tails. And it looks vaguely normal. So there's a normal curve superimposed on it, and that's not an accident. Um, a sample of 2 is quite small, uh, uh, but as, as the sample size increases, uh, this will, will, it turns out, approach a normal distribution. Now, let's um, uh, compute the mean and the, and the variance of, the, of this sampling distribution. So let's find the mean using my simple table. We'll multiply across, add them up, and the mean of the sampling distribution is found to be 2. So, notice that the expected value of x bar, so the mean of this distribution, is exactly the same as the mean of the population distribution, 
What does the population distribution look like? Let me go sketch it for you. So here's 0, 2, and 4, and we have three bars, all of size 1. So that's the population distribution. And the mean here is also 2. So the mean of the population distribution equals the mean of the sampling distribution. The way I like to describe this is, on average, you're going to get the right answer. On average, you get the truth. So across these samples, sometimes the sample comes in too high, gives you an x-bar that's too big. Sometimes the x-bar is too small. But on the average, you get the right answer, which is 2. Now let's find the variance. So we find the variance using the usual way, and the variance turns out to be 4 thirds. Now that's a lot of work. It turns out that there's a shortcut formula. Just like we had a shortcut for the binomial where we only had two possibilities, there's another shortcut for uh, this more general case. If you take the population variance and divide by the sample size, so 8 thirds was the population variance up here, divide that by the sample size, you get 4 thirds. That's a remarkable result. So this tells us approximately how far will our statistic be from the truth. So what is the typical deviation of x bar from mu, which is the same as mu, mu sub x bar. All right. Now if we inspect this formula, you'll see that there's an n sitting in the denominator, which means the larger the sample, the smaller the variance. So on average, we're going to get closer to the, 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 the parameter mu as our sample size grows. Now, let's um, turn up the sample size a little bit using this exact same population of 0, 2, and 4. Um, let's do a silly thing and let's enumerate all 3 to the third, which is 27 possible samples of size 3. So what happened if I drew a sample of size 3? Well, I'm going to leave this for you to confirm on your own, but here is the resulting sampling distribution. So there's one chance in 27, you got to get three zeros in a row, um, and so that has probability 1 27th, 1 over 27. If you graph this, um, you get something that's fairly normal. So I'll, I'll leave that as a little challenge for you. I, I strongly encourage you to, to test this, and if you have questions about it, see me in class. So you might want to pause the video right now and, and try to work through that. If you look below, um, I, I worked this out for a sample of size 10, and what you'll see is the sampling distribution of x-bar is mighty normal. So it, the, 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 this, um, this normality thing really works. Now this next slide summarizes everything you're going to need to know about sampling distributions. So in particular, let's say we have a sample of size little n from a population of size big N, the means mu, the variance sigma squared sub x. Here are our measurements, x1 through xn. We're going to talk about two different random variables, two possible things that we might want to estimate, the, the two estimates, I should say. So one is the total. We might just add up all the uh, x's. That's the total, the sample total. The other thing that we often do is find the sample mean x bar as we did in the previous examples, so t hat over n. Here are the results. First off, on the average you get the truth. So the expected value of the sampling distribution is just the mean. So we've already seen a very concrete example of this two slides ago. So remember, the mean of the sampling distribution was 2, which was the true mean of the population. For a total, you multiply through by n, and so the expected value of the total is just n times mu. Theorem. If we sample with replacement, then the standard deviation from this, of the sample mean is this, sigma over root n. Again, we've seen an example of this a couple pages ago. Here was sigma squared. 
So just take the square root of this result, you get what that theorem is showing you. So that's why it's so important to understand that simple example uh, where you can really um, get your arms around what's going on. For total, it's sigma times root n. Theorem, if you sample without replacement, then there's a correction factor. Um, I don't hold you responsible for this uh, sampling without replacement. I don't think it's that important. It doesn't come up that often in, um, in the work that you're likely doing. One thing to note is that it's the same as this as the previous theorem, but there's a correction factor, 1 minus little n over big N. So now, a few minutes ago I said whenever big N is large and little n is, you know, modest, so let's say we have a million people in the population, which is not unusual for marketing problems, and we draw a sample of a couple hundred. Well, a couple hundred over a million is a tiny number. 1 minus a tiny number is about 1. Take the square root of about 1, and you get about 1. All right, so in that situation where the sampling fraction is small, then these two theorems give about the same result. So that's why um, uh, you know I say don't don't worry about it. In most of the situations you're going to be in, that sampling fraction will be small, and so just go forth and use Excel and SPSS uh, without giving it a second thought. Two more results. So the first I call the normal normal theorem. It doesn't really have a, an accepted name, but we, I, I want to give it a name, so we'll call it the normal normal theorem. This states that if you are sampling from a normal distribution, then the sampling distributions of x bar and t hat will also be normal. Now that's, um, that's interesting. Uh, the one that's even more interesting is the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem is very similar to the normal normal theorem, but it's, it says this. It doesn't matter what the shape of the population distribution. It can be right skewed, could be left skewed, could be bim bimodal, could be uniform. I don't care what the shape is. The sampling distributions of x bar and t hat are going to be approximately normal as long as your sample size is large enough. We've already met a special instance of this. The normal approximation of the binomial is one example of this. So the population distribution in that case looked kind of funny. So let me go show you what that looks like. The population distribution of a binomial looks like this. Here's 0, here's 1. This is probability pi, this is probability 1 minus pi. All right, so that's clearly not normal. Uh, what the normal approximation of the binomial said was if you draw a sample that's large enough from this, then uh, x bar, which is the same thing as p in the previous chapter, in the case of a binomial, t hat is the same as xb. Those uh, statistics are approximately normal as long as, in that case, n times pi is bigger than 5 and n times 1 minus pi is greater than 5. It turns out that this holds for any distribution, and that is, is really a mind-boggling result. On the next slide, there's another example worked out for um, sampling without replacement. I'm not going to talk you through this, but I encourage you to uh, work through it. It'll, it'll really um, make your understanding of sampling distributions that much deeper if you work through another little example like this. Okay, in a subsequent video, I'm going to work through some of these problems with you.